Hello and welcome back to the Come Follow Me Bible Challenge. My name is Jeremy Howard, pastoring Orchard Hills Bible Church down here in Payson, Utah. And uh, it is currently May 25th. I have been recording a lot of these episodes ahead of time. The last several you've listened to were recorded well in advance because I have been on a sabbatical this summer. And see, it's weird because I'm talking past tense about something from my perspective, that hasn't happened yet. It's pretty weird. But uh, Lord willing, I will have been on (laughs) a sabbatical, kind of funny to say it that way, where uh, I needed to record a bunch of these ahead of time and plan them, schedule them to publish at the right time so I wouldn't have to worry about doing these while I'm trying to rest. So a little bit weird for me. I just recorded the episode that was about Matthew 24 in the tribulation and what Joseph Smith did to the text of uh, the Bible there. An interesting longer episode. want this episode to be shorter, though. That's the goal. And we are going to be looking at Acts 17, where Paul is speaking at Mars Hill in Athens, this uh, public square in Greece, the big city of Athens. And he... uh, is talking to a bunch of Gentiles, not Jews, but Gentiles. So kind of a unique look at, at what's going on. I, I love the book of Acts. I mean, it's so stinking hard. And you know I say this every week, but this week on the schedule, it's uh, Acts 16 to 21. For crying out loud, I could spend a couple hours on each chapter and have a great time, but I would probably be the only one having a good time. So We're just looking at the end of chapter 17 and trying to keep it under a half hour. That's the goal. Acts chapter 17 is where we are, and I think what I'll do is just start reading it, but pause along the way to share thoughts and then give a summary of it. I don't know. I don't don't do these the same every time, as I'm sure you've noticed, but that's what I'm going to do this time. Acts 17, starting at 22, verse 22, Paul in Athens at the Aero... Pegas. Huh. I don't know why that word looks funny to me this time, because I've obviously read this several times before in the past. I thought it was different than that. Aeropagus. Okay. (laughs) That's what's called Mars Hill. Okay, this public square. Paul goes out to preach to a bunch of Gentiles. Verse 22. So Paul stood in the midst of the Aeropagus and said, Men of Athens... I observe that you are very religious in all respects. That's where we stop today for the first time along this journey. Paul stands up to preach to a bunch of religious people. Why? (laughs) Isn't that interesting? Because um, there are a lot of people today who take the view of, oh, you know, you're religious, you're trying your best for God, God bless you, pat you on the back, move along. Why would you preach to the religious? Shouldn't he be going out and finding the irreligious or unreligious or anti-religious? Why is he preaching to religious people? Shouldn't he just support them in their religion and they're all finding their own way to God and God works with them and through all of that and he honors them and blesses them and that's it, right? Isn't that good? Well, the answer is no. The answer is they need to be preached to. They need the gospel. They need to believe something else than what they currently believe. Otherwise, they are in for a world of hurt. They are in for the judgment of God. So that's the first thing to pick up on today, is Paul is preaching to religious people as he should. Just because someone is religious, that does not mean that that person is okay with God. In fact, that person could be, and likely is, under the wrath and condemnation of God. Because biblical Christianity is where you get the gospel. And there are many religions out there outside of biblical Christianity with many false gospels. That's why I say, just because someone's religious, that person is still likely under the wrath and condemnation of God. And that's why Paul preaches to such people. That's why Christians today should still preach to the quote-unquote religious. Paul tells them why he thinks they're religious in all respects, very religious, I should say, in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar 
with this inscription, To an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. I love this. Paul takes opportunity here by seeing that they have this, uh, this inscription as a part of their worship to an unknown God, because they are polytheists. They believe in lots of gods, as are Latter-day Saints. They're polytheists. Actually, technically, Latter-day Saints are henotheists. There are lots of gods, but you only worship one of them because there's only one that you know. So you got monotheism, polytheism, and henotheism, which tries to take a, a middle view. Well, they're polytheists, and they want to worship all of the gods that exist, but they're, of course, open to the reality that there are gods out there that they should be worshiping that they don't know about. And so they build this altar to an unknown God to kind of cover their bases. And so Paul sees that and he says, you know what? Yeah, let me tell you about the God you don't know. <laughs> I love that. The, the only God there is, the only knowledge that matters for the salvation of your soul that's what I'm going to tell you about. So he kind of uses their context, and we'll see this more here. He uses their context to open a door for the gospel. All right, let's keep reading. Verse 24. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. Wow. So he starts with this really big picture of the creator and creation divide. The more that I teach and preach and serve in ministry, the more I'm understanding how important it is to have this these categories in your mind of eternal creator and finite creation. It comes up all the time. So he starts by explaining to them that God is, the, the true God is eternal creator, and you are finite creation. He, he tells them that he is not bound by anything, and he is in not need of anything. He, he has no needs whatsoever, because what these um, Greeks have done that all false religions do, all, I, I mean all here, is it has reduced God to uh, this creature-like existence, where they believe that God needs human worship to keep him going. And so they are, of course, really particular about making sure they have the right temples, the right altars, the right inscriptions, that they list out all the gods, and they, again, cover their bases. And uh, as far as it depends on them to just make sure they are they're doing what they need to do to, to keep not just God, I guess, but all these gods going. And Paul says, well, the God who made everything, and that, of course, is the difference between... <laughs> the one true God and false gods. If I can remember the reference off the top of my head, I'll show you where it says this in the Psalms. I'm sure we've looked at this before. Yeah, it's Psalm 96. Let me get this flipped over here. Um, we'll start in verse 4. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, for he is to be feared above all gods. All the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Now, there's a paradigm for you, and this is essentially what Paul is teaching them. you got all these gods, but there's only one of them who made everything, the true God. And Paul says, let me tell you about him. So he, he kicks off this by saying, there's the eternal creator of all things who doesn't need anything. And he says even, he doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. Because their view was, we have to build these temples so we can go meet God. We have to build a house for God to live in, so that way we can interact with Him. And Paul says, no, that's not how it works. God, of course, is omnipresent. He's everywhere all at once. He's not like a, a creature that needs shelter. And their view was, we have to build Him a temple so we can go commune with Him in the temple. And perhaps you've heard people say 
that that's where God is. He's in the temple. And you feel closest to God when you're in the temple because that's where he is. Well, heed Paul's words here. You can put yourself in the sandals of one of those men of Athens and hear his words saying, no, that's actually not the case. God, as holy, eternal, omnipresent creator, he's around you right now. And uh, you are, of course, to fear him. And if you are in your sin, you can only fear him. However, if you're a believer, you can take great comfort in that he's around you all the time, (laughs) that you don't have to go to a temple. If you're a believer, he's with you all the time, sustaining you. He's with you, uh, guiding you through this life and encouraging you, building you up. But if you're in your sin... It's crazy. He's not tucked away in the temple, and as long as you stay away from the temple, you're okay in your sin over here, and he won't know, or he won't do anything about it, or whatever. No, no, no. God is everywhere all at once, and the wrath of God abides on you if you're not a believer in Jesus, if you don't have the the shield, the protection of the blood of Jesus Christ covering you, okay? So Paul here is giving them some pretty high level, I shouldn't say high level, I guess big picture is what I mean. Uh, view of this distinction between creator and creation. And he continues, verse 26, when he says, And he, this one true God, made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. Sounds like he's a firm believer in Genesis 1 and 2. He made from one man all the nations of the earth. That's kind of anti-evolution, isn't it? That's just something to point out, all right? So God made all these nations. He appointed their boundaries. God is sovereign. Okay, that's another aspect of him being eternal creator. And he did all this, verse 27, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Remember, he's not tucked away in the temple. He's not far from each one of us. Seek him while he may be found. Verse 28, For in him we live and move and exist, even as some of your own poets have said, for we are his children. And he's quoting the poets there. The poets have said, for we are, or for we also are his children. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art of and thought of man. So he says here that God created man, created all the nations from one man, and therefore, as one of the poets have said, we are his offspring, we are his children in that sense. The poets got something right. Even the broken clock is right twice a day, right? So they finally got something right. We are the product of God. Therefore, we should not think that God is like something that we can conjure up in our minds or like something that we can develop through our art with gold or silver or or any kind of stone, precious stone or common stone. He is altogether different. He is holy, eternal creator of all things. He's the one who made the heavens. And what some people have done, particularly Latter-day Saints, is they go to this passage and say, Well, see, we are his children. That means that God is a man like us. He's an exalted man, and we are his children. We are just not exalted yet. We're working our way there. And we are all children of God. All the people on the face of the earth are his children, meaning that we are born with relationship to him that is good. And it is up to us what we do with that through our agency. We can either foster that, encourage that, build it up, fan the flame in a good way, or we can reject, rebel, and kind of go downhill and perhaps end up even being a son of perdition if you go that far. Well, that is not the theological framework that Paul is coming from. Don't put that on this text. Remember, Paul here is upholding the Genesis narrative, Genesis 1 and 2. Genesis 1.26, God says, let us make man in our image. It's a great triune verse. There's one image, but a plural pronoun for God. He says us and our, and he's making man in the one image of God. Man is not 
Trinity. God is not human, but there is this image-bearing aspect that all human beings have as the special crowning creation of God. So that's what's going on in Genesis 1 and 2. It's important to have that in your mind and not project something else on here. And Paul here he's appealing to the Athenians, the, the Greek people, in their own terms, where he says, look, you've got this inscription to an unknown god. Well, let me tell you about him. Well, he's not saying that, he's not validating all their other gods and saying that the unknown one is the, the one that they should know about while also maintaining their worship of the other gods. That's not it, because those other gods are idols we just saw in Psalm 96. So he's using their context to launch off into good, solid biblical teaching. And here, where he's using one of their poets, the poet who says we are all children of God, he's not affirming some LDS view that we are all literal offspring of an exalted man, and therefore we, all, we are all born into right relationship with God without need of adoption. That's not what he's saying at all. In fact, the Bible teaches us explicitly that we are born separated from God as children of wrath. That's Paul himself in Ephesians chapter 2 says we're children of wrath and we follow Satan in our natural state. So we must be adopted. That's, the, that's a beautiful doctrine of the New Testament. And we see that in John chapter 1, where it says in verses 9 through 13 that there was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world, Jesus, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He's eternal creator, unknown by his creation. Verse 11, he came to his own, and those were who, who were his own did not receive him. The Jews rejected him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. It's something that had to happen through a conversion. They weren't naturally children of God. They had to become children of God through receiving him. Even those who believe in his name. That's what it means to receive Jesus, believing in his name. And they were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but they were born of God. Those who were born again, evidenced by their believing in Jesus, receiving Jesus, they are the ones who become the children of God. They have to be adopted, okay? And Paul, again, the one preaching in Acts 17, says in Galatians 4, 4 through 6, When the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth His Spirit, uh, the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Okay, so this adoption business is important. You have to be adopted to be a child of God. You are not naturally a child of God. So back in Acts 17, when he says, one of your poets have said, for we, are, or for we also are his children, being then the children of God, we ought not to think of the divine nature, like silver, gold, stone, an image formed by man. He's not saying... We all have good relationship with God in our natural state. He's saying, yes, you're right in saying that there is a creator who has created us. And in that sense, we are his children. We are his, we are his offspring. We are his production or his, the, the product of his work to create us. So that's the sense in which Paul is using that terminology, not reading into it some sort of view that we are naturally children of God in that other sense, okay? So he's, he's talking to them in their context, and you may have noticed through here that, uh, or maybe you've heard this before, that he's only using the general term for God. He's not saying Lord. He's not making reference to the Old Testament at all. There's no quotation of the Old Testament. But he's using the general term for God because these are people who have no context for Yahweh, the God of Israel, for the stories that are found in the Old Testament. But instead, he's using their false worship, the inscription to an unknown God, and their own poets, instead of using the Old Testament, which is very fascinating. And he says, okay, this divine nature, you, you recognize there is the divine nature that exists, and you are not him. Think of him as eternal creator of all people, rather than something that we make, the product of our hands. Instead, we are the product of his hands. Very, very important. Difference between creator and creation. 
Verse 30, Paul continues saying, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Now Paul gets to the gospel, and he he makes it succinct. He says, God has been very patient with you. He hasn't squished you like the little sinful bugs you are. But instead, he's saying, repent, come come to him through faith in Jesus. The one who's going to judge you can today be your savior. Instead of meeting him after death as your judge, you can meet him today as your savior, and that's who he will be now and forevermore. And the proof of this is that he was dead, but now the tomb is empty. The proof is that Jesus has risen from the dead, and no one could argue with that. These were people who were alive when Jesus rose from the dead. They knew where he was buried, and they could not disprove this claim that Jesus rose from the dead, and that makes all the difference. So he calls them to repent by believing in the person and work of Jesus. How did this conclude? Verse 32, Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer. But others said, We shall hear you again concerning this. So Paul went out of their midst. But some men joined him and believed, among whom also were these people, whose names are different than the names we're used to seeing today. (laughs) Dionysius, Dionysius, the Aeropagite, so he must have been Athenian, huh? and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So, uh, after Paul preached this amazing message, some sneered, some wanted to talk to him more about it at some other time, so they kind of kicked it down the road. They punted and said, yeah, we're open, but others believed. If you were to consider your position today, uh, say you're an unbeliever, and you're hearing this message through me today about the gospel. Which of those groups do you fit in? The sneering group, the let's talk about this more some other time group, or the today's the day I'm going to believe group? And which group do you believe God wants you in? Those are important questions to ask yourself, and I think I'll just leave you with that. Thanks for listening. God bless.